So now it's my pleasure to introduce Mark Sinnott. Um, so Mark is uh, probably well known in the community for under one of his many hats. Um, so uh, we know him well as a member of the board of directors for Kingston Writers Fest. Um, he is also um, the, an award-winning author. Uh, he has two collections of poetry, two novels, and a collection of stor short stories under his belt. His uh, short story collection, Bull, was uh, praised as provocative and polished and contained an admirable range of stylistic flourishes coupled with a solid sense of the genre's formal possibilities. So I think he'll uh, bring something very interesting to the conversation today. Um, also, his most recent publication, Carnivore, won the Toronto Book Award, which Pr uh, which prizes books of literary or artistic merit that are evocative of Toronto. Previous winners happen to include such people as Margaret Atwood, Michael Ndachte, Austin Clark, and Dion Brand. So not poor company at all. Uh, his talent for vibrant description and evocation of place is also reflected in his website, Machines for Living In. Uh, it's quite an eclectic blog that combines literary, literary musings with some of the most compelling real estate copy you're likely to come across. Um, so it, it, it is uh, really quite, uh, quite unique and uh, worth a gander. So um, it gives me great pleasure to welcome Mark Sennett. Thanks very much. Thank you for coming. Um, okay, let me tell you how this will unfold. We've got an hour, no more. They've run a pretty tight ship here, so there's not a lot of time with the, with the three of us up here or the three of them and me up here to talk, so I'll try and mostly to stay out of the way. I'm going to introduce each of the writers, and they'll give us a brief reading, somewhere between five and ten minutes each, and that's your first half of your hour. And after that, I'll ask them some questions, and we'll chat for another 15, 20 minutes probably, and then finally, we're going to open it up to uh, questions from you in the audience. And hope that sounds OK. Um, here we go. Swing in the House is Anita and Anne's first book. She was born in Montreal, but has also lived in the Bronx and in Bedfordshire and in British Columbia. And that's relevant because Anita has said in interviews that wherever she landed, she was always the only person of Indian origin in her age group. She was always the outsider. And it's that perspective, she says, that informs her work. Reviewers have been kind, to say the least, and often speak admiringly of her talent for giving voice to the voiceless and the invisible. Dennis Box sums it up well when he says, I think, this is a wise, assured, and wonderfully intelligent collection that announces the arrival of an exciting new talent. Please welcome Anita Anand. Thank you for that very kind introduction. Um, I'm not sure how to use the microphone, however. <laughs> Is it too, um, can you hear me? And it's all right. I'm on my tiptoes, however, just to let you know. I'm going to start by reading a very short, short story. It's called What I Really Did. And it was inspired by a conversation that I wasn't supposed to hear. I was eavesdropping on my children. And they were talking about a girl that they were a bit worried about. They were talking about her without any judgment in their voices. But as a mother, I was kind of worried about this kid. And I was wondering where her parents were and whether she was being properly, properly loved. And I sat down and I wrote this story. You say you want to know what we did on our summer vacation. But do you really want to know? Why would you ask teenagers this question? You know that for most of our supposed vacation, I was taking remedial math. You don't know about the last two weeks. All right. On the last day of August, I traveled to Barcelona with my parents. My mother had an obsession with mosaics. The trip was a present from my dad to my mom. They brought me along because what else were they supposed to do with a 13-year-old girl? It was too late to send me to camp. The hotel was a three-star, four-story job. Our room had a double bed and a cot in the corner for me. The comforters were plush and orange. Not super exciting, although my mother kept exclaiming to my father how clean everything was, as if she'd been expecting to be living in filth for two weeks. The two of them went off every day to look at tiles. I always pretended to be sleeping in the morning when they set off. So after trying to wake me up a few times, they'd leave me alone. As soon as they left, I'd raid my mother's cosmetic bag, put on loads of makeup, 
a long t-shirt but no shorts, just underwear and flip-flops, and run to the plaza by the magazine stores, the, the plaza they didn't know about, where the other putas stood around, chewing gum and tottering on their high heels. I say other, but I was not really a prostitute, just a wannabe, just a kid traveling with her parents, hoping something would happen to her. I never actually got picked up. I don't think it was because I was too young. The makeup made me look almost 10 years older, I swear. Maybe it was the flip-flops. <laughs> However, on the last day, I went to another plaza where artisans were selling their stuff and where a group of Peruvian buskers were playing. I spoke to a beautiful man who was selling cheap jewelry, and to my relief, he understood my Spanish, whereas none of the locals could. This was because Jorge was Peruvian, and Mr. Cortez teaches us South American, not European Spanish. I joked that I wanted to buy some jewelry, but had no money, so would he just give me some? He picked a necklace off its hook. It consisted of a pewter chain with a long cross made out of wood, crudely painted green and studded with tiny tiles. He put it around my neck. Then he asked me if I wanted to go somewhere with him. Jorge was tall, had very dark skin, very long straight black hair, and stunning green eyes that were much more like jewels than anything he was selling. He packed his stuff in a little wooden case, took my hand, and led me out of the square. I thought of saying, I'm 13, but the words didn't come out. We went in a little red door, and then up a set of narrow stairs into a small, barely furnished apartment. We went into his bedroom. There was a mattress on the floor and a light bulb hanging from the ceiling. He motioned to me to lie down. I asked him to tell me about where he was from, but he's one of those people who looks really artistic, but doesn't have an imagination or a flair for words. He just said he was from Peru and that he was an Indian. I asked him to tell me about his family, and he just snorted. I gave up and let him kiss me and pull up my shirt and kiss my breasts. He took his jeans off and started to pull off his underwear, and I asked him about condoms. He said he'd be careful. My Canadian education asserted itself. <laughs> Necesita usar un condom, I repeated several times until he gave up and put his pants back on. He lay on his back, smiled at the ceiling, and shook his head, sighed, smiled at me, shrugged, and told me I was killing him, that he was in agony. He kept his hand on his crotch, and I looked at it curiously. I hadn't actually ever seen an erection before and wished I'd been paying more attention when he was in his underpants. I asked him if he wanted his necklace back, and he just laughed and asked me how old I was. I turned onto my stomach and put my head in the pillow so he couldn't see me blush. After a while, he said he had to go run some errands. Did I feel like waiting for him? I said it depended on what time it was. He laughed at that, too, and asked why. He said life was too short to worry about what time it was. I told him that he was right and that it didn't matter. I told him that because I couldn't very well say it was because I had to be back at the hotel room 10 minutes before my parents returned so that I could wash my face and put some pants on. He got up and went down the stairs and out the door. About a minute later, I went out too. Suddenly, I realized I was lost. I hadn't paid attention to how we'd gotten here from the plaza. I ran a few blocks to make sure I wouldn't run into him and just started walking any which way. The air was starting to get sticky and smell like meat. After what seemed like an hour, I heard Peruvian flutes and ran towards them. I froze as I spotted my parents walking hand in hand, their backs to me. I ran in the other direction for several blocks and found myself back at the end of Jorge Street. Jorge was knocking on his own door. He was holding a small white paper bag with a picture of a green cross. Before he could turn and notice me, I flew back the way I'd come and miraculously found myself back in the street of our hotel. Sitting on a bench by the door were a Turkish couple my parents and I had met in the elevator. They squinted at me curiously, but didn't seem to recognize me. I ran into the hotel, washed my face in the bathroom on the mezzanine, and took the fire escape up to our room. I crossed my fingers and prayed that my parents hadn't come back yet. I turned the key in the lock and crept inside. They didn't notice I wasn't wearing pants. What they noticed was the necklace. That's beautiful, my mother said. 
You should have let us buy that for you, honey, my father said. We've been looking for something for you. We feel so bad that you've been left on your own so much. How much did you pay for that, my mother asked, opening her purse. Thank you very much. So Greg Hollingshead. Act Normal is Greg Hollingshead's first collection of short stories, I believe, since the very wonderful The Roaring Girl back in 1995. I was putting my own first stories down on paper back then, and that book sat on top of my reading pile for years. Its great style and wit, the unusual shapes of the stories, their great economies and breathtaking turns seemed a demonstration of everything I couldn't do and still can't on most of the days. This new collection, coming after a couple of very well-regarded and prize-winning novels, is every bit as good, except perhaps it's a little funnier, a little darker, and in, enti and in an entirely positive way, it's more complicated, and occasionally it's even quite unsettling. I was fascinated by every one of these characters and bewildered by a good number of them as well. I read these stories to be ready for this event today, of course, but next week, without any deadline pushing me, I'll be, I'll be starting them again because they're that good. Please welcome Greg Hollingshead. Thank you, Mark. I, 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 I wouldn't have written anything <laughs> better myself. If I, that's great. I feel great. Thank you. I'd like to read from a story called Sense of an Ending, which is um, about halfway through the book. I'll just read the, the, opening, the, opening, uh, the opening pages. Micheline was spending the day with her husband's family at his grandmother's. It was mid-morning and most people had fanned out across the fields. There must have been 12 or 15 of them with buckets moving slowly, scanning for mushrooms. Micheline was with them, but she didn't know anything about mushrooms. Walt was out of sight, and the mosquitoes were biting through her socks. Mostly when she leaned down, she was scratching, and then everybody was running. Family members there that day she hadn't seen arrive came rising up in silence over the crests of hills and materializing out of the woods. When she saw those closer to her glance around and start to run, she ran too. Everybody was running back to the house, and she ran with them. At the house, some people ducked in the side door and disappeared out the front. In the living room, one of the sisters was on the phone. Other people didn't even go inside. Five minutes later, everybody was jumping into their trucks and roaring off. There had been an accident a flipped combine at the farm where one of Walt's brothers was helping out a neighbor. Micheline stayed with the grandmother, who lived with a pair of high-strung Rhodesian ridgebacks and kept small paper bags of whorehound in the dishwasher and old newspapers in the warming oven. Another time Micheline had been there, the grandmother was cooking steaks on a grill on the porch. When one of the dogs snatched a steak from the grill, the grandmother flew to her knees and tore it from its mouth with her teeth. <laughs> now, in the night from her bedroom, the old woman shouted her grandson's name. Once, five minutes later, the phone rang. It was the parents. Nobody had known how to reach them. They were on a retreat and hadn't called in ten days. No sooner had Micheline hung up the phone than the dog started howling, and then the phone rang again. It was Walt from the hospital. Micheline remembers the pile of turfy mushrooms by the side door, everybody dumping them as they ran into the house or around to the front. Micheline's own pail sat by itself on the kitchen counter, a third full, half its contents poisonous, as the grandmother pointed out to her, Mushroom by mushroom. I guess they don't teach mushrooms at the university, the old woman said. 
And Michelin thought, this is what you get when you pick according to what you can see of what the person next to you is picking. The person picking next to Micheline was Flory, one of the cousins. Flory had a condition that prevented her from seeing any color except blue. On account of this, or in defiance of it, Flory wore glasses with blue lenses. Micheline wondered at the blue lenses, but who can say what blue lenses do to a world that's already blue? They certainly didn't compromise Flory's mushroom picking ability. Hers were in a pile by the side door, in the pile by the side door, and there were no poisonous mushrooms in it, as the grandmother reminded Micheline more than once. Micheline can only nod. It wasn't just the grandmother, it was this family when it got together. In their company, she couldn't find a voice of her own, and the one she could find, she had too little control of. She'd make a light joke about Walt that even to her at the time sounded aggrieved and judging. You'd think she was unhappily married, which as far as she could tell, she wasn't particularly at all. Just try not to attack me in front of everybody, Walt suggested on the drive home after she'd said something especially hurtful. It makes me think that's the reality and the rest is the aberration. When she told them she hadn't intended what she'd said the way it came out, he said, sure you did. It's you in that situation. You're like the guy with the severed corpus callosum. Ask him to point and he gives one answer, but orally he gives another. He laughs at something he doesn't know he's been shown, and when asked why he laughed, he gives a plausible reason without knowing he's made it up. A family operating in harmony was a new experience for Micheline. She doubted the viability of such a thing and feared that to undertake, understand this one, she would need to take it apart, and then she wouldn't be able to put it back together again. Either that or the emotion she would need to set aside if she hoped to fit in would burst out somewhere else and cause damage. Sometimes she wished she could appreciate these people without feeling she had to be one of them, and then she'd remember she already was one by marriage and give a little gasp of surprise. In the family Micheline had grown up in, things had a way of not coming together or staying put. Her parents didn't drink, but they were always falling downstairs or having car accidents. One or the other was usually on painkillers or in bandages or a cast. Weekends were dominated by family tasks, which started out with everybody in a lethargy of irresolution, escalated to shambles, and petered out. People would agree to take separate vehicles, but somebody would get the time wrong or go to the wrong place or crash on the way. Convinced this was no place to learn how to survive, Micheline moved out to go to university. And today, when she visits, her parents' lives are no less on the brink of ruin. Their marriage, her mother's health, her father's job, they're losing the house. Micheline's sister got it right when she said to her one day when they were 13 or 14, you know, if this was a horror movie, our family would be the first ones to die. She and Micheline were biological siblings who had been adopted together. The worst thing they could say to each other was, you are their biological daughter. <laughs> when Micheline was little, she assumed that she and her sister were the only people in the world who had thoughts. As an adolescent, she'd be in church or at a school assembly or family gathering, and it would be, feel like more than she could bear to spend another second in the company of people so evidently as oblivious as dogs to the absurd and stunning triviality of what they were doing. It took all her strength, which was enormous, because she was in a rage, not to leap up and scream, fuck this shit! <laughs> How this impulse related to subsequent self-destructive impulses such as climbing into Terry Cochran's car on the night of her 15th birthday, 
or not quitting spoke, smoking until three years ago. She wasn't sure. A monk who sets himself on fire or a samurai who commits harakiri does it on principle. What was hers? People are dumb and I hate myself for being one. That didn't sound right. <clears throat> Most people weren't especially dumb and she wouldn't have mind being like one of the ones she liked, dumb or not. Thank you very much. I don't know if you see what I mean when you, you get to the end of one of Greg's sentences and you think, hold on a second, what just happened there? And you, you, you read it again and, and, and you smack yourself in the forehead and then you laugh and that's the way they work for me. So Olive Senior. The stories in Olive Senior is quite brilliant and often very moving new collection, The Pain Tree were written over many years. I, I, I went to the acknowledgments and I think the title story's first publication is all the way back in 1998. And I think what I find most surprising of all, uh, and this is a book of many surprises, those that unfold slowly and then those that just explode on the page, isn't so much the evolution of a talent and craft that we're witnessing in these pages, as it is the incredible intensity of the focus that she's able to maintain on a subject plainly dear to her, which is the people and history of Jamaica in this collection. I must admit I'm a newcomer to all of Senior's work, which includes the collection Summer Lightning, which won the Commonwealth Writers' Prize, and the novel Dancing Lessons, which was a finalist for the 2012 Amazon.ca First Novel Award. But trust me, I've been trying to make up time in the last couple of weeks, and I've been pressing this book on family and friends as much as I possibly can. Please welcome Olive Senior. Thank you for that splendid introduction. Is that better? Okay. Um, I'm going to read an excerpt from a story called Boxed In, and um, I'll, I'll give you a brief introduction to it because it arises out of my interest in the encounter between tradition and the modern and the impact it has on people. We all know stories about people who have seen a train for the first time and faint or, or people who have seen their first um, airplane fly overhead and have gone insane and so on. So I wanted to write a story about this and I chose television, somebody's first encounter with television. And the story is set in Jamaica right after the uh, Second World War when Canadian and American mining companies arrived to exploit bauxite, which I'm sure people here know is the raw material for aluminum. And a lot of people were dislocated. And in my story, a whole village of people are moving, are in the process of moving to the town, including the protagonist, Mr. Everett, who the story is about him. It's a very long story. Um, but what is significant about him, he is at first very interested in this whole, uh, this encounter with TV, with television, um, although he has absolutely no idea how it works. But the problem with him is it's an encounter with um, power. And this is what totally un is, is his undoing, because he's a man of um, many parts, and one of them is that he traffics in the occult, and that is his source of power. And suddenly, and, and which makes him the strongest, most powerful person in the village, and suddenly he's encountering a power that is beyond anything he could imagine. So... Um, Mr. Everett first saw the object of his demise in the new electrical store on the main street of the town, standing in the middle of the big plate glass window. The box was made of a hard, shiny substance that was obviously strong enough to keep hostage and withstand the stirrings of the powerful forces it had captured inside of it. As those knowledgeable would expect, it was painted black. So the unearthly blue light, which was emitted only through the glass light front, 
the kind of light Mr. Everett associated with powerful manifestations could not otherwise escape. Fortunately, he first viewed it around 10 a.m. in bright sunlight when no spirits were abroad. So he was at first more curious than afraid, approaching it as he did from an oblique angle. But when Mr. Everett passed the idlers who were constantly congregated outside the store window and walked right up to stare the box fully in its face, he got such a gut-wrenching fright that a ghost familiar of his world would have been far less disturbing. Inside the box, there were people moving, waving their hands, opening their mouths as if talking, occupying a world just like that on Earth. While all newcomers to the box spent their time speculating on how television worked, Mr. Everett did not get that far. He was immediately struck by its implications and it rooted him to the spot. It was the greatest science he had ever seen. Someone had invented a box that could not only reduce people in the world to doll size, but get inside their houses, capture their images as they crossed the street or got on a bus, ran across a field or ate their food, display to every idle passerby what they were doing in the privacy of their homes. He even witnessed two people kissing. Mr. Everett had no idea who these captives were, but they seemed totally unaware that strangers were watching their every move. Here was this woman in her dining room laying a table. Mr. Everest, Everett, despite himself, was just getting used to her, admiring her straight body in that neat dress, her cute little apron, her page boy hairdo, her high heels in the kitchen, when suddenly a man entered through the door. The man was shouting and waving his hands. He was angry. Mr. Everett wanted to shout a warning to the woman, but pulled himself up short, glad he had not done so. These were rich white people, the type who would never let the likes of him into their fancy homes. For some unaccountable reason, the scene was at that point interrupted by a smiling man standing in front of a brand new car to which he pointed, his mouth opening and closing as he walked around it as if inviting someone standing out of sight to admire its features. As Mr. Everett watched, he began to feel less and less anxious, began to enjoy the antics. The man in the car disappeared, to be replaced by a man and woman all dressed up and dancing with long gliding steps. He could see now this was a world of action, of people coming and going at a speed that was dizzying, scenes forever changing. He could see the people's lips were moving, and when he followed Bailey into the store, he realized the boxes, there he saw several more, had also captured sound. After that introduction, he went back more and more to view the people inside the box in the store window. He became more and more convinced that they were spirits, for they were all as white as chalk. In the netherworld, all became pale and ethereal, ethereal, each indistinguishable from the other, in which it was a world in which people were remarked, not by appearance, but by behavior. And this made him less anxious about the box. If its activities were centered not in this life, but in the world of spirits, a parallel universe, it was something he could understand. One of Mr. Everett's closely guarded secrets was that he dabbled in the spirit world himself. Not that he would have used the word dabbled for something he regarded with such seriousness. He began to think it might be possible to learn a thing or two from the box and invented excuses for going more frequently to town, something he had avoided in the past, to watch the flickering world of ghosts in the shop window. One day, he got a rude awakening when an unmistakably black face appeared in the box. One he knew could be no spirit. He rushed inside the store to hear what it was saying, and his knees almost buckled under him. The handsome young black man was singing the very songs Mr. Everett and the rest of the villagers were accustomed to singing at every roof raising or digging match when those things still happened. How had they got hold of their songs? 
A chichibado, the young man sang in a honey-like baritone. Some of them a holla, some a ball. Mr. Everett's discomfiture was complete when the man broke into day-o, day to light, and we want to go home, just like the banana loaders down on the coast. It was a very song he and Bailey had been given to singing together in fun so many evenings before the box had parted them, as it had, though Bailey didn't know it. The power of the box, Mr. Everett now knew, was complete. It was everywhere. It was here. Thank you. So you all write so differently from each other. I think that was, as I was reading these books over the last two weeks, the, the, the thing that struck me most immediately was that these are incredibly different collections coming from incredibly different places. And with, 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 with Anita's stories, I feel like I'm eavesdropping on this small group of mostly young people's lives for a few hours or in, in one or two cases even a few seasons. And there's, there's something casual and voyeuristic about that experience as, as if those stories kind of float through an open window down the block to where I am. And, and then with Olive's work, you've got this, and I'm giving you this sort of summary of how I feel because I'm lucky enough to have read the whole collection so far, and, and you've just got that small taste. But with Olive's work, there's that wonderful, unnerving sense that these stories have always existed. I don't know if you know the work of Gillian Welsh, the, the sort of the, the folk singer who sings these, these original works that, that seem as if they've been around forever. It's an absolutely timeless experience listening to them, and I got the same feeling reading Olive's stories. And the narrative unfolds in so fluid and practiced a fashion that it's as if all these pieces have been handed down almost from generation to generation. And then you've got Greg's world, which is something entirely different. Um, each piece is so tightly wound and so precise in its geometries, I feel that one word would have everything absolutely falling apart. So what I'm wondering is if you can tell us just briefly how, how it is you go about writing a story. Everyone want, always wants to know how you go about this. What are the, the methodologies and mechanics of it? And more specifically, how much do you know about the arc of it and the events involved and its shape when you put those first words, those first sentences down? To what extent do you know it all and to what extent do you figure it out as you go along? <laughs> well, all my stories are character driven. So first, I have to have a strong character. And I live with my stories for a very long time with these people inside my head. And um, obviously, there has to be, I have to put them into a situation of conflict. Um, but in a way, um, the story, I, I don't want to say it writes itself. But once I know who my character is, and that character sets off down the road, then he or she is going to meet another character, or there's going to be an encounter, something is going to happen. But unless I have that character, I can't make a start. You know, so that is where all my stories start. Except for the story that I read, where I started out with an idea of something I wanted to write about, and I, I started out with the television set, as you know, and then I combined it with the mining people coming in, because I really like the idea of um, people on the cusp of change, you know, something ha that's happening in their environment that is going to force them into a transformation. So, so there is an inevitability about it. Once you've got yes. that character, you yeah. feel that you don't necessarily need to know the ending. You will find it as you work your way through the story? Yeah, it, it, it varies. But, yeah. but generally, actually, I, I, I write a lot of stories, of my stories in my head. You know, on, until I'm, I, it's happened in my head, I really don't attempt to write. So when I come to write, I put it all down because I, it's worked its way through the, the, you know, the process over many years, usually. So it becomes a sort of translation process, getting it down onto yeah. paper. Yeah. Yeah. How about you, Greg? Uh, well, I certainly don't need to know uh, where the story's going. Um, and it can be a character, it can be a, a, a line, it can be a tone, a voice, it can be an image. This, the, this, the opening that I read for this story, which was how the story began for me, was a story that um, a friend told me about um, uh, picky mushrooms just as with uh, her husband's family. And they all started to run back towards the house. And that was, I, you know, I, I make um, 
I make notes on six by four cards. I have boxes and boxes of six by four cards. And that was one of, the, that was, that, well, that idea was on, on a card for years. And, uh, and then I, um, I just thought, I kept, you know, you look at these notes, these images or these lines on the cards and, and um, you know, if after four or five years they're still interesting to you, then maybe you can do something with it. So uh, I, I love that image. So I, that's where the star story started. And then her character emerged from that, from the scene. So. Hey. And you're putting it down on four by six cards. Does it, do you write longhand as well? I write longhand, yeah. Yeah, just yeah. the first draft, or? Uh, well, it's uh, <laughs> I write. Uh, yeah, I, uh, the first draft's always longhand, and I um, I have uh, I <laughs> I put it in the computer at the end of the day, and then I and then I start revising what I put in, and then I go on, and I it's some one of my students described it as ironing. It's like ironing. <laughs> It goes on like that. Uh, the, the the written stuff is in the computer at the end of the day. The next day, I'm starting with a clean typescript, uh, which I revise and then go on, and then it, the the thing slowly accretes and becomes right. right. Anita, um, I don't think I, s I, s I have a method at all. Um, I think that uh, when I write, it's because something has moved me, and I just start writing. And I don't know if it's going to go anywhere. And, um, and I have a first draft. And then I decide whether I'm going to do something with the first draft or not. And in some cases, I go back to that first draft, I don't know, tweaking for like months, you know? <laughs> it, mm -hmm. takes, it, ta it takes me an awful long time to, um, to get my first draft into the shape that I want it to be but when I just sit down and the story just sort of comes to me if I especially if I write in the morning especially if I write um, when I'm not quite when I haven't had a coffee yet um, <laughs> it seems to everything else is harder writing seems to be easier because I'm not um, I'm not sort of crippled by self-consciousness yet you know and I just uh, you're not awake yeah <laughs> I'm not conscious and I'm not self-conscious so the writing comes quickly and I just it's you know it's almost like it's dream writing and I just write and then later I look at what I've got and sometimes I think my goodness I have the beginning of a story do you have any sense of, sort of the percentage of things because you, you, you you're not writing automatically but you're just writing to see if there's anything there and then if there is you'll yeah. go back do you have any sense of sort of what percentage you know how much good and how much stuff is there that you just have to reject and I'm asking that for purely selfish reasons just to feel better about my own <laughs> you know with the big filing cabinet yeah. full of rejected pieces but I don't know I, I can tell you that uh, the title piece uh, in this book Swing in the House it, it, was, it used to be about 180 pages and um, I put it in a drawer and I took it out many years later and I hacked and hacked and hacked at it and now I think it's 70 pages right wow Greg I read in a review somewhere that this collection this new collection is quote about the struggle to find love and truth in a broken world and I read that and I thought no it's not <laughs> <laughs> and then I read that you said, Olive, and you said it a little, you paraphrase that again today, looking back at your collection as a whole, it seemed that you were writing about people on the cusp of a great change. But when I read the interview, it didn't seem to me that you necessarily had that thematic strand in mind all along, that you were, you were answering a question an interviewer had asked you, but that it wasn't something conscious. But reviewers and interviewers are always looking to find those common threads and links that connect stories in a collection. And so what I'm wondering is, is that the right way to approach a collection of stories? Or is it a mug's game to go looking for those common threads? I mean, the stories, I, I know that for Greg and Olive, you wrote these stories over a, a large, uh, a number of years. And I'm assuming, Anita, with your first collection, that that's also true. It's not in the concentrated rush that you would create a draft for a novel, for instance. So should we be creating, or should we be treating a collection of stories differently than we do as a novel? 
And this novel, uh, stories sometimes breathe a little bit better if they're taken out of the context of a collection of stories and appear somewhere in a magazine. I'm wondering what it does to them when they're all put together like that and reviewers come at them from a certain angle. I don't know if you have feelings on that. I don't know. Um, my, my first three collections, actually, I sat and wrote mm -hmm. one story after another after another. This, this is unusual in that these stories were written over a long period of time. They've been published you know, in, in literary journals and so on and then put together. Um, I, I don't know that it matters. I sort of tend to resist any, any idea to um, impose rules or laws on what I do or what writers do. You know, I think we, we, we follow our own um, intuition. We do what we have to do. We follow our imperative. This is how I operate. And so I don't like to sort of label or categorize or box in what it is that I'm doing, you know? Do you ever find that a reviewer will do that to you? And oh, you absolutely. Think, oh. Even more so, um, you know, people who teach your work or write about it and so on, because they have to find something to write about. But I, d mm. I don't, I mean, I, I don't sort of let that influence me in any way. Do you ever um, think, oh man, they're right, that is what I do? Sometimes they're right, and I learn a lot yeah. from, from this and from my writing students and so on. And sometimes I think, boy, this is bullshit. They just don't <laughs> get it, you know? So, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. one can't take it too seriously. So you do read your reviews and you do sort of, you yeah. do evaluate what they're saying. And sure, yeah. sure. Hmm. Well, I, um, I, I, there's a, the point when you're finished with the book and the and, and the, the, the publisher says, now, now write something that enables us to tell people what it's about. Mm -hmm. And I, it's the sort of thing that editors should be able to do, but editors often can't write. <laughs> but um, I, uh, um, I I, 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 I'm, with a story collection, I find it difficult. I'm just like the next reader. So I'm sort of making up things to say about it uh, as if I were, a reviewer trying to think up things to say, common threads and so on. And uh, so I tend to learn a lot by the kinds of things that smart reviewers come up with. Um, I'm, I mean, I'm aware as I'm putting it together a collection like this, because this, like all of us, it came over like almost 20 years, some of these stories. Um, as they came together, uh, I began to notice very belatedly that there were resonances but it's only because I have certain obsessions and certain things you know they, it comes out of a kind of a natural fact that it's from one mind it, there was nothing intentional about it so I, I guess I guess I'm saying I'm, I'm grateful when reviewers find those resonances when they seem um, justifiable um, and it's natural that people want to find you know, when you put a story collection together, w when, when you decide which stories are to go in, because I started with 21 and we you took 12, and, and when you're deciding on the order, uh, I think you, you really sh had better be doing it by intuition, by feel, right? It's what feels right. Um, and so that's how you proceed. Um, but the teacher or the reviewer has to you know, articulate, so then it becomes, you know, a, um, articulated sort of thing, and then it, and it becomes something else. But I'm always, um, I'm always, I'm always uh, listening to what people have to say. So you created this, this sort of box for those 12 stories for 2015, but you got those, those eight stories left. Do you expect those to be put in another box somewhere down the road, or, the, or do you find those go to the back of the filing cabinet and, and it's harder to revive them? I don't know. It's hard to say. Some yeah. might be revised. <clears throat> Some uh, I might put on my website if I decide not to do anything more with them. Some some were fairly pretty minor. Um, some have already been published. In fact, strangely enough, um, my published, most of my published stories recently didn't get into the collection, so I don't know what that means. <laughs> but, so they've already been published. Mm -hmm. So, How about you, Anita? Um, 
Which question are you asking me? <laughs> <laughs> we've covered a lot. I mean, they've, they've, co they've covered a have, lot. The, the, the one about the, whether it's fair to uh, sort of go hunting for a theme that connects all your stories or whether you feel that limits the possibilities of each individual story or even the collection as a whole. No, I, I don't think it limits anything. I, I think I, I'm always very interested in, in what readers find in, in my book. I think writers write from a very intuitive place, as um, both Olive and Greg have have mentioned. We write from a very intuitive place, and it's not a very articulate place. So if someone asked me what my book was about, I would have a, I, it would be a struggle. In, in my case, it was the editor who wrote the paragraph about what my book was about, and it was the editor who put my stories in order. I'm not sure I would do the same thing that he did, but I don't think that he was wrong to do what he did. You know what I mean? Like each reader brings their own way of looking at things to what they're reading, and I'm not. I can't be objective about my writing, and I can't really tell you what it's about, unfortunately. Does the flow of those stories that your editor settled on, does that... That's he, he, uh, he told me he was organizing the stories thematically. That's what he said. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> You've also said, um, and you quoted, I think in the promotion of what was for this festival itself, as saying, and correct me if it's wrong, because I know people can be qu quoted wrongly, if there's one thing that drives me to write, it is the sense that there's still a lot of ignorance about what it means to belong to a visible minority. Rather than rant about white privilege, I've chosen to try to bridge the gap in understanding in a gentle way. My hope is that fiction can do that, that it can create empathy. And so it's obvious that your ambitions here with this book go way beyond solving questions of just aesthetics and craft, that there's there's politics at work here as well, and I wonder if you can talk a little bit about that. Is it, and is it the same, is it true for all of you? Are you interested at all in the political or the educational possibilities for your work? Maybe starting with you. Okay, all right, so it drove me to, that, that feeling drove me to, to write some of these stories, not all of them. Um, uh, I think I probably said that I was having a bit of a bad day. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, some of the stories are about about what it feels like to be a visible minority. Um, there's one about a, a, a girl who is half of half Chinese, half European origin, and she doesn't see herself anywhere, and her boyfriend's trying to figure her out, like, what, what is she so cranky about? What's the problem? What, what is she, you know, what's the big problem that she can't see herself? anywhere you know why is that a problem and I just I don't know I just wrote a story about what it feels like you know to well, not see yourself anywhere I, there was somebody at work who was ranting about the fact that on Coronation Street now uh, she can't watch the show because there are too many visible minorities and I don't think that she I don't think she's a racist actually I think she just thought that these people were just put there as a, I'm sorry <laughs> put there as um, tokens you know and, uh, you know, I was listening to her, and I didn't say anything at the time, but I went home and I wrote the story about the girl who doesn't see herself anywhere. Well, and having those people in there as tokens is a, is a racism of a sort itself, right? So, and you, you, you do populate your stories with, and the reviewers talked about, those invisible people and yeah. the, those voiceless people. Is, is it true, I guess that's what I'm asking, is it true that you are trying to sort of say, hey, look, we're the same, we have yeah. the same concerns as you, we're living in the same cities as you. Is, is it as overtly political as the quotes made me think it might be when I read them? Yeah, maybe, it, maybe some of the stories, yes. Some of the stories, that, you know, I was, sometimes when you, you sit down and write a story, it's because something's bothering you. Right? Yeah. And yes, a couple of the stories were right. from that. I, I don't really agree with the word token. I, I think I think it's necessary to have people who represent, you know, different colors, different religions in in our literature, in our movies. I I don't I don't think of these people as tokens. I think of these people as representatives of what's out there. Right. Um <clears throat> no, there's no um it's uh I guess what it how do I say this uh, without sounding like a jerk? Um, <laughs> it's, it just seems to me that w there's not a lot of, um, y in the course of the day, uh, you don't really encounter much um, truth, um, except from 
you know, I mean, I'm talking about the media mostly now, the media. Um, so, uh, you, you know, you get it from people, you get it from your friends, you get it, you know, um, s some of them anyway. Um, so that's all. I'm just trying mm -hmm. to kind of up the uh, up the the insight factor. I'm just trying to kind of do that. But you know, they're my insights, I, and that my hope is that they they translate right. That people recognize them as as worthy of saying. But who knows? Well, uh, to be honest, that's the, that's the sense I get from your book is that you you're trying to mine deep into into the into what it means to be a thinking, uh, sentient sort of being rather than to make any political statement. And Olive, what do you? Well, for me, the story is everything. You know, that is what matters. M every story is, uh, represents my desire to communicate something to a reader. So that's, that's the bottom line. But at the same time, we're all human beings, and I think I'm a political person in a small p, uh, in the sense that you know, I bring a, a certain, I come from a part of the world which is a small island, it's a tourist destination, therefore it's not looked at as a rail place and the people who come from it are not rail people. <laughs> and so I think my, uh, the subtext for me in all my writing, whatever it is that I'm writing, is that I want to write against stereotypes. Um, you know, in terms of the history of the place I come from, in terms of the politics, and even in terms of my own person. Um, mm -hmm. that, that is my concern. Right. To represent a place and a people and so on in a real authentic kind of way. That's what mm -hmm. I hope to do. I've been incredibly rude and haven't left much time for you. Um, <laughs> But there are five, maybe a couple of extra minutes, I don't know. But uh, do we have some questions out there in the audience? Hi. I'm curious, uh, over the course of the last few days, writers have talked about keeping uh, thoughts and um, ideas and notes together. Greg, you mentioned that you have cards. How do you organize those cards? How do you <laughs> access that information that you collect? Because I imagine it can become quite a body of information and data. How do you organize it so you can retrieve it when you need it? Well, it's, it's why I use cards as opposed to a, a notebook because it's hard to organize the contents of a notebook. You have to read it through. But you can shuffle cards. So, I, you know, I mean, sort of as I said, you know, there's a file for character, file for for lines, phrases, quotes, quotes from people. I mean, I, I you know, um, story ideas and so on. They're just simple like that. It just happen to be a lot of them. And you know, it's and and every once in a while. I mean, I have had the a, a, a student asked me in Winnipeg the other day, "What's my favorite technique?" <laughs> I couldn't think of a favorite, but my favorite technique actually is taking some of, some of the cards like a, sh a fan of cards that are still, uh, you know, have some uh, life in them for me and seeing if I can, if it will uh, suggest a story. That's fun. It rarely happens, but that's fun. Hello. Hello? Okay. <laughs> this can go to anyone, but I was wondering if you could talk about some of the unique challenges of writing um, short stories as opposed to, like, a novel or another form? Well, I, I write in, in different genres, but my favorite form is short, whether it's a story, fiction or poetry. I've written one novel because I was got, I got, I don't think people take you seriously as a writer until you've written a novel. So I wrote a novel, <laughs> but it was, you know, I'm, I'm happiest with a short form, with a short story form, because I, um, my, my favorite, um, analogy or th the way I look at, at the, this is that a novel is like a string of pearls and a short story is like one perfect per pearl. And it seems to me it's much harder to write short stories because every short story has to work. You can't get a bad short story published. But we all know a lot of very bad novels do get published. And so I like the challenge of, of being able to polish something, you know, and make it as perfect as I can. And that, that's what the short form allows you to do. 
Maybe, maybe one more. Or maybe not. Okay. Well, I want to thank you all very much for coming and thank the three authors, of course, for appearing here at Kingston Writers' Fest. Um, they will be setting up at the back of the room and, and selling some books, so that's the one thing we should all do before we leave today. And uh, again, thank you very much.